I'll never forget the first time I heard that song, right after I got saved. It's unique. That's good. Amen. I'm glad you're here. You're not here by chance. There's a reason for you being here this morning to hear what I'm about to say. If you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn to the book of Genesis chapter 15. If you'd like to stand as we open the Word of God. The book of Genesis chapter number 15 and verse number 1. In Genesis 15, 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed. And lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. Father, bless this book in thy name, I pray, amen. You have to read the narrative of the book of Genesis as Abram is called from Ur of the Chaldees to get an understanding of what's going on. God had raised Abram up in stages as he does us all. Faith is a progressive learning experience as you understand more and more about God and as he meets the needs in your life as they come into this walk of life. They don't all come at one time, they come progressively. Therefore, you learn more about the Lord progressively. A hundred million years from now, we'll still be learning more about the Lord. But in the book of Genesis, chapter number 15, God had singled out one man and called him out of pagan idolatry and darkness to reveal himself to him. Not only did God reveal himself to Abram, but he called him for a singular purpose, and that was that through this man all of mankind would eventually be blessed. Abram, if he had chosen uh, his own way of bringing this about, which he did with Hagar, would have messed it up big time. But God Almighty found the man that would believe him. There's something about God that demands faith. Faith is not something that you can produce, you can't, you can't manufacture it, you can't find it. But the Bible says, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. The Word of God is a powerful thing, very powerful. Once heard, you must do something with it. If it enters into your soul, then my friend, it takes root. And when it takes root, it will bring forth fruit in due time. In the 14th chapter of the book of Genesis, Abram had just returned from rescuing his nephew Lot, who had been taken by the king of Sodom, or by, by a foreign power. He'd been taken by these kings that had rebelled against Ketelohamar. And so he took him, brought him back, and when he came back, the king of Sodom offered to give Abraham something. Abram said, absolutely not. I will never let it be said that I was enriched by the king of Sodom. The words that he chose were very powerful. He said, I have lift up mine hand unto the Lord God Jehovah, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say, I have made Abram rich. And then in the 15th chapter of Genesis, the Lord said, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. I can't emphasize to you enough this morning the fact that if you have the Lord, you've got everything, but if you don't have him, you have nothing. For there is absolutely nothing on this earth that is eternal 
except that Holy Spirit that God has put in your soul, His Word that you're reading now. Everything else is going to pass away. It has no substance to it. It is here today and gone tomorrow. That that men put so much stock in is the very thing that God holds in disdain because it has no value at all. So lift up your head to the heavens. Look into those stars and count them. And you begin to understand the ability of the Almighty to do above and beyond all that you could ask or think. Don't be limited by your mind. Don't let that natural inclination and that thinking ability get between you and the Lord. He wants to raise you up to a much higher level, a level of faith where he can talk to you in a way that he can't talk to you right now. So we read in the book of Genesis how that the righteousness of God is manifested to Abram. For the Bible says he counted it to him for righteousness. That's quite a remarkable thing. For Abraham was already a man of faith. He'd already come out of her of the Chaldees. He'd already gone down into Egypt and come back out of Egypt. He'd already gone back to Bethel where he was at the first and built an altar to the Lord. He'd already been walking with God. But none of those things, the Bible says, were counted for righteousness. It was when he looked up into the heavens, into the stars, the Bible said that God counted it to him for righteousness. Now, righteousness is a powerful word. It's a big word. What does it mean, preacher? It literally means in a right standing with God. In the way we might say it today, right with God. But there's no way that you can be right with God on your ability. It's got to be given to you. It's got to come down from above. But I want you to notice how this morning that it's connected with something. And this connection is brought forth for us in the New Testament books of Romans and Galatians. The Apostle Paul begins to unveil for us what actually went on this day when Abraham looked up into the stars and he believed in the Lord. And the Bible said God counted it to him for righteousness. If you have your Bibles, turn over here to the book of Romans, chapter number 4. And verse number one, what shall we say then that Abram our father is pertaining to the flesh hath found? Verse 13, for the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Verse 16, therefore it is of faith that it might be of grace. To the end the promise might be sure, watch carefully, to all the seed. The law was given 1,400 years before Christ, but grace came 1,900 years before Christ when God gave grace to Abraham and said it would be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Verse 17, it is as written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. You'll never walk with God by walking in sight. You will never walk with God by depending on human reasoning and understanding. He will never walk when you walk on your ability and your accomplishments, what you can see and what you know. You'll only walk with him as he opens the path before you, as he raises you higher, as you reveal, as he reveals to you what you're willing to receive. From the book of Genesis through the book of Revelation, it's a book of gifts, one gift after another, administered by the grace of God, gifts that are so marvelous and so wonderful. But the problem is not the giver. The problem is not with the gift. The problem is with the one who can receive it. Are you able to receive a gift? Are you able today to let God speak to you in a way that you've never been spoken to before? Abraham had never looked into the stars before this day like he did this day. When God bid him to look up into the heavens, Abraham marveled at what he saw before him. And God said, now you see those stars? Abraham, as far as the eye can see, count them for me. Go ahead, Abraham. I've got plenty of time. A day with me is as a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. I'll just sit down, Abraham. Abraham. 
and you go right ahead. You start to count them. And of course, Abraham was immediately overwhelmed with what was facing him. There was no way that a human, a, a human being could possibly count the stars of the heavens. So what God did by saying that was get his attention. He was saying, Abraham, now I want to show you something. And Abraham, of course, was a man who was willing to trust God. Listen to him. Open his heart to him. And realize that Abraham wasn't the sum total of all things. That he wasn't the repository of all wisdom. That he wasn't the greatest thing walking on the face of the earth. That there was one much higher and greater than him that could raise him up above what he was. If he had brought him up out of her, the Chaldees, out of heathen darkness, and out of that place of hell that he was born into, then surely he could raise him a little higher. Surely there was more that he could know about this God that he served than what he could scratch out and understand and figure on his own. And so the Apostle Paul begins to tell us what this seed's about. He begins to reveal to us the conversation, no doubt, that had, that had gone on that day, that night rather, when Abram was looking into the heavens. There must have been a revelation to the heart of Abraham about what was about to take place. You see, Abram means father. But God changed his name a little later on down in his walk with him. He took the fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, hey, and he put it in that name Abram, and he called him Abraham. And when he called him Abraham, he said, now nah, you're not just a father, Abram, but now you're the high father. You're going to be the father of all that believe. Me, God? Why, well, I'm just old Abram. Lord, I'm dust and ashes. That's what he called himself outside Sodom and Gomorrah, who is just dust and ashes. You mean, yes. Let me tell you something today. It is not of you that runneth or you that willeth, but of him that calleth, that can do above and beyond what you could ever imagine and think. Don't ever compare yourself with yourselves. Don't ever look at each other and say, you can do this and I can do that. It's not what you can do. It's what he can do. He that hath begun a good work in you. And my friend, please understand this morning, this is so important. It's not my ability that God needs. I don't have a gift to give him, but he's got everything to give me. There is no end to what he can do for you and what he can say to you and where he can carry you. So here he tells us in the book of Romans 4 verse 18 who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken so shall thy seed be. He must have known. He had to know. He had to know that the promise of God was greater than his ability to perform. And so when everything did not figure out and did not look right and could not be understood, he still maintained his hope, his trust, and his faith in God. He said he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. This is Paul's commentary on what you just read in Genesis 15. In Galatians 3, he continues, Even as Abraham believed God and was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Abraham's my father. The Bible says in the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. What a remarkable thing. For there was no written scripture when Abraham believed God. The Bible did not exist on this earth when Abraham believed God. It was the spoken word coming forth from the mouth of God. That word preached and that word looked into the future. Listen, when he spoke the word, the word itself has the very life of God that spoke it. Did you get that? The word that comes forth from the mouth of God has life of God himself. And the very word of God one day became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We handled him. We touched him. The word of life, John said, we were not, we were not led about by divers, uh, by, by false witnesses and so forth. Peter said, we were with him on the holy mountain and saw his glory. Amen. And so the Bible says in the book of Galatians, to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, 
which is Christ. Boy, from Genesis chapter number 3 and verse number 15 all the way to the time of Abraham. In other words, long before the flood, they had been looking for the Messiah, the Mashiach, the anointed of God, the coming Christ to the earth, the one who would come and carry them away from heathen and darkness and carry their sins away and save them and be to them a Savior and a Lord. They were looking for that Christ. They were looking for him. Did they ever find him? No. God called a man out of Ur of the Chaldees. And when he followed him and accepted him and believed in him and walked with him, out of his very bowels came forth the promises of Genesis chapter number 3 and verse number 15. From the most unlikely place on earth, God raised up the seed which was Christ. Amen. That's faith. He was counted righteous. He was made right with God. The word righteous goes along with the idea of justification. You cannot be righteous and not be justified. That's a, that's a total, it's, it's no, there's, there's no way it can be compatible. If you have been declared righteous, you have been declared justified. Justification is the legal term that God uses in a court of law to say, I know you're guilty. I know your sins are guilty. I know you're condemned. I know you deserve it. I know that hell was created for the devil and these angels. And that's where you're going. But I've done something to stop that. I have interceded on your behalf. And now because of that, I have justified you. And the New Testament says that he can be just and the justifier of them that believe on Jesus. If you have been justified through the blood of Christ... You ought to rejoice this morning and thank God for it. Now we move from Abraham, a righteous man. Abraham, not righteous because of his ability, but righteous because of a declaration that God counted him righteous because he added his own righteousness to the account of Abraham. He put it down on his ledger next to his name, and nobody can dispute it, for there is no higher power. Then we come to the unrighteous. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 6 and verse 9, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. That's the unrighteous. You live with the unrighteous. You rub shoulders with them every day. Some of you live with them in the home. Some of you are unrighteous. What is unrighteous? An unrighteous one is not right with God. No way can you be righteous and live the kind of life that the apostle mentions in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse number 9. If you are any of these, is this the kind of life you live? And you think you're a Christian, you're living in deception. You're living a lie. You're living blinded by Satan. My church says it's okay, preacher. Get you another church. My preacher says it's all right. Then find you another preacher. Because the Bible is plain. Be not deceived. Let me give you a warning about unrighteousness. The greatest danger of an unrighteous person is this. If you don't get anything else that I say about it, please get this. Here is the greatest danger of being unrighteous, of continuing in sin and living a godless life and wallowing in iniquity. What is it, preacher? Who knowing the judgment of God, that they that do such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but take pleasure in them that do them. What is that? That's a reprobate mind. That's the danger I warn you about. That you will come to a point in life where you know that you are condemned and you know you have no hope. And so you throw up your hands and say, what's the use? I'm going to hell anyway. I might as well enjoy what I have here and now and drag as many down with me as I can. And that is a reprobate mind. 
Now let's come to the last one this morning. And I want to bear just a little bit on this one. In the book of Luke, chapter number 18, verse 9, the Bible said, He spake this parable to certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Now, first we've talked about a righteous man. How was he righteous? God imputed it. Then we talk about an unrighteous man. How is he unrighteous? He practices sin. Now we come to a self-righteous person. Self-righteous. Who trusted, notice carefully, in themselves that they were righteous. But turn to Philippians chapter number 3 and verse number 6. And this helps us to understand a little bit about the mind of a self-righteous person. Philippians 3, 6. In Philippians chapter number 3 and verse 6, listen carefully. Listen to the Apostle Paul. He says, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law. Watch this. Blameless. Now, did you get that? Touching the righteousness which is in the law. Blameless. Now, Paul, wait a minute. Did you not confess to being guilty of leading women and children? back to Jerusalem to be stoned to death? Are you not guilty with blood on your hands of innocent people? Were you not zealous for the law above your brethren? Did you not even say that? And yet here you say that the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Now here we're going to enter into something this morning that will help you understand the mind of a self-righteous man. <clears throat> the scripture says here, that according to the righteousness of the law, blameless. The Word of God says that the law is righteous. It is the holy declaration of the righteousness of God. Is there anything wrong with the law? No. The problem comes when the law and humanity meet. The law remains righteous. Never has been anything wrong with it. Never will be. It is the inability of a human being, a frail human being, to keep it. The Apostle Paul says they heap burdens upon you which they want you to bear, and they can't even bear them themselves. By the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified. So what's he mean? What does this Apostle mean when he says, The righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Could he be saying that from a mocking perspective? Could the Apostle Paul say, looking at the law, why sure, I had the law. I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, of the tribe of Benjamin, circumcised the eighth day, set at the feet of Gamaliel. If you'll read the third chapter of Philippians, you'll read his pedigree. He lays it out for you. But then he looks back at the law and he says, even though I was under the law, I had no conviction, there was no heart burning, there was no guilt, none of that bothered me. Because in my own eyes and in my soul, according to what I lived by, I was okay. In other words, it was his understanding of the law. It was his ability to take the law and create what he wanted to for his own world to live in. It was his ability to take his standards and his convictions and his beliefs and create this religious world that Paul felt comfortable in. Yet all this time that he was comfortable in this, he was a murderer. That's self-righteousness. Self-righteousness is when you have created a life that you feel comfortable with because you can't stand the guilt that comes with real sin. When the Holy Spirit convicts your heart and points out in your soul where you're shortcoming to the righteousness of God, comparing you with a Savior and His shed blood, you can't handle that. So what you do is that you've created this religious world. Oh, I know you call yourself a Christian. I understand that. But you've learned down through the years to overlook so many things. You don't let them bother you anymore. And now you carry your righteousness as a banner for people to see how humble and holy that you truly are. What you're doing is trusting in yourself. You don't understand what it means to come before God as a guilty sinner. It's hard to get a self-righteous man or a woman 
right with God. For they trust in their righteousness. They built this wall of separation. You'll not cross it. They live comfortably in their religion and in their sphere. But I want you to understand this morning, the Lord Jesus Christ did something for us. And he did it for us. He did it for you and he did it for me. What secret oath have you taken surrounded by your symbols and words to a strange God? Did you hear me? Where were you in some room with some man laying hands on you, swearing allegiance to some strange God and symbols and words and, and candles and light? And all along your heart was beating and thumping and saying to you, you're in the wrong place. You might not have known it, but now you know it. What perversion are you practicing in secret that nobody knows anything about? Oh, I know you come to church in Sunday school. I know all about it. But what's going on in your real life? I'm talking about the real you. Who's the real you, preacher? The you that is away from the sight of people alone. That's the real you. When you're not in front of people and putting on a show. What deed have you committed that eats at your soul? They, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, what secret do you harbor in your heart? When was the last time the Holy Ghost spoke to you? When? Just a few days ago in Brunswick, Georgia, a woman was pushing a stroller with her little child in it. These two teenagers walked up to her. They walked up to her, and one of them said to her, give me your money. She says, I have no money. He says to her, give me your money. She said, I have no money. He fired a weapon into the ground, fired at her and, uh, two times, and then he said, do you want me to kill your child? A little baby in a, in, in a stroller. Do you want me to kill your child? No, don't kill my child. Don't kill my child. He walked over there, and he took that gun and he fired into the face of that little baby sitting in that stroller what is that preacher that's evil let me tell you something about that instead of start screaming about gun control and ammo control why don't we go to find out what caused this 17 year old to grow up like that what caused that What's the real problem? You know what the real problem is? Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and problem sin, folks. That's the problem. That's the problem. That's the problem. And it's the inability to deal with it. It's refusing to face the simple fact you live in a wicked, wicked world. A world that has rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. A killer at 17 that has no more conscious, conscience and remorse than to walk up and shoot a baby in the face in its crib. Somebody said, I can't believe how low we've gotten. Hold on, it'll get lower. So I can't believe how bad it is, preacher. Just watch it get worse. Watch it get worse. Let me tell you something. Everybody in this house is in need of the blood atonement. There lurks in the heart of every last one of us that killer that put that gun in the face of that baby. Oh, I'm offended by a statement like that. Then you don't know what it is to get right with God. Because our very soul, from the top of our head to the bottom of our feet, there's no soundness in us. When Christ went to the cross, oh, how he suffered. Listen to this as the last part of my message this morning. Listen carefully. Who in the days of his flesh, Hebrews 5, 7 through 9, when he'd offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. Though he were a son, Yet learn the obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him. Hebrews 2.10 For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory 
to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Did you notice how that the salvation of a sinner is associated with this suffering, with this crying, with these tears? He bore our guilt. He bore our shame. He bore our condemnation. He bore our terror. Hebrews 12, 29 says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God for our God is a consuming fire. You said, that's going to make me feel that way. Yeah, but you haven't never faced death. You don't know what it's like. You just think you do. You see, when it says with strong crying and tears was able to save him from death and was heard, in that he feared. The Lord Jesus Christ suffered on the cross at Calvary. Yes, he did. God forbid that I should say anything to take away from that suffering. That was horrible. The English language today uses a term excruciating to speak of the worst pain possible. The word simply means forth or from the cross. Excruciating. The physical suffering of Christ is unbelievable. But the spiritual suffering of Christ is just as bad. When he said in Gethsemane, if there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. He wasn't talking about the cross. He was talking about the wrath that he had already begun to feel. He bled in three places. He bled at Gethsemane. He bled in Pilate's judgment hall, and he bled on the cross. He shed his blood in three separate places, each one associated with the gift of God. In Pilate's judgment hall, those stripes heal you. At Gethsemane, God saw the travail of his soul and was satisfied. And at the cross, God was in Christ. There is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The pain that he suffered in his soul was your terror, your horror, your sin, your condemnation, your damnation. He bore that in his soul as far as it could be borne. Why? Because he was going to draw up what your salvation would be like. He became the author of eternal salvation. Him. He created a salvation, wrote it with his blood, sealed it with his life that did not exist until he did it. That salvation means that I don't care what you've done. Don't let Satan deceive you. You can be forgiven. Don't let him drive you from God. Let the Holy Spirit draw you to God. I don't know how to plead with you this morning. There are people that feel like, well, I go to a certain church, I'm okay. No, I don't care anything about your church. I want to get mean with you this morning. I couldn't care less about your church. I don't care anything about your denomination. I don't care anything about your priest. I don't care anything about your past. There's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Your church won't save you. There's only one name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. By the name of Jesus, the precious blood of the Son of God. If your church preaches that, good for your church. If your preacher preaches that, good for him. But I'm going to tell you this morning right now, don't throw your religious, self-righteous chest up in my face and boast and brag about how your heritage has led you to this and you've created this and you've done this and you've accomplished that. Folks, we're nothing we are sinners in need of cleansing the problem with a self-righteous man he never has anything to pray about he has nothing to get forgiveness for oh I know he reads it off Lord forgive me of my sins and blah blah what sin which one I grew up in churches 
when somebody runs down to the aisle, come down here to pray, and that's good. That's what you need to do. When they come down to the aisle to play, or the altar to pray, they'll run to 1 John 1, 9, and they'll take them there. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's true. That's very true. But you see, I never saw it used but one way. It was always used one way. And that is to get some poor old backslidden soul right with God. Well, that's good. There's certainly nothing wrong with that. But folks, it means a whole lot more than that. 1 John chapter number 1 says, If you say you have no sin, you make him a liar and the truth's not in you. It's that walking in the light as he is in the light. It's that constant confessing of your weakness, your frailness, your inability, and the fact that you only can have by the blood of Christ purge your sin, cleanse you. Have you ever gotten to that point yet? To where it's a daily matter. Every step I take, every breath I breathe, every beat of my heart, everything in my soul has to cry out to him, Lord God, I need you. I need you. And I'm glad you didn't show me all of this at one time. <laughs> I couldn't handle it. But piecemeal, he brings you closer, lifts you higher, blesses you greater. As you walk in the light, as he is in the light, you'll have fellowship one with another. What's the light? The light is the work of the Holy Spirit to point out who you are in Christ and what you need by his finished work in your life at that moment, working daily, moment by moment, as you walk in the Lord. And I guarantee you, you may think you have no sin, but I assure you, everybody in this building, if you pour your soul out before God and get alone with him for just a little while, he will begin to show you some problems. But then he'll forgive you for them and cleanse you and work in your heart and draw you near to him. Father, in thy name I pray. I delivered what you put on my soul. That's all I am, Lord. I'm the messenger. I'm finished. And now, Lord, it's your work. It's the work of the sweet Holy Spirit. That's not my realm. I stand outside and I reverently watch now what the Holy Spirit does. That's your work. And I glorify thee, and I praise thee, and I bless thee for one more time to stand and declare the book. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Stand up and sing. What have we got, brother? Page 227 in your all American. <laughs> <laughs> You come. Ever wondered what these people look like? Abraham? I'm going to see Abraham one day. I'm going to see Moses one day. Adam. David. Joshua. Samuel. Solomon. See him one day. Apostle Paul. John, 
They're real people. This is not metaphors I'm preaching to you folks. I'm preaching real people to you. <laughs> See them one day. One day I'll look into the face of God. One day. One day. The Almighty. I heard a song on the radio the other day in the Christian Broadcasting Network. And I don't know what the title of it was, but they were singing about him being the Almighty. I never heard anything like it in my life. It was beautiful, but it was powerful because it was written in such a way that I can't explain it with words, but simply say the way they sung it, the Almighty, there he is. There he is. He's always been. He's above everything there is because he's the Almighty. He looks down upon us. We live underneath him. He supplies our need. He gives us our breath. He's the Almighty. He's the Almighty God. When the Lord got ready to change Abraham's name, you know what he said to him? He said, walk before me and be thou perfect, for I am Almighty God. In Hebrew, you've heard it a thousand times. It's El Shaddai. El Shaddai. Almighty God. Hallelujah. Amen. Hollywood tries to put on a show or something, you know, or they make a Christian movie to try to manifest the, the power of God, and they have bombs exploding, and they have the skies moving and all of that. Sure, all that stuff happens. No question about that. Do you think for a minute that that's any indication of what it is for him to be Almighty God? No. That's just something spectacular that moves the flesh. Okay? That's all as good as far as it goes. That's all it is. It's spectacular. When we talk about him being Almighty God, we're talking about something you can't even explain with words. It goes much, much deeper. He's the Almighty. And so my Bible tells me in Revelation chapter number 1 and verse number 8 of the Lord Jesus Christ that He is, what's it say? Let's look it up and you get home this afternoon. Revelation 1.8. He's El Shaddai. He's the Almighty. Amen. Sing another verse. An invitation to come. Yes. The Almighty. Almighty God. <laughs> Almighty. Is my plea. Hallelujah. Abraham. Huh. Abraham. How was Abraham saved, preacher? By faith. By grace through faith. He believed God. That's how he was saved. That's how Abraham was saved. How were they saved under the law? Same thing. Law never saved anybody. Deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified. How were they saved? Grace through faith. How are we saved today? Grace through faith. What's the difference? You're born again now. <laughs> born again. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Woo! 
Amen. 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 How many times he's prayed and the Holy Ghost of God is filled with his heart. Amen. And he has got to save you this morning while I'm going to save him. Amen. Hallelujah. That's what makes the difference. Yes, it does. It makes all the difference. Amen.